Welcome once again, dear friends. Uh, here today we are discussing about the stress testing. As uh, you are aware that stress testing is basically to identify the functions of myocardial uh, muscles to detect any kind of uh, ischemia or not. This is the main purpose. And uh, today here uh, in the uh, in these sessions we are going to describe this overview of the stress testings and. Uh, we are already discussed a little bit about it, uh, it and in these sessions, uh, Dr. Uh, Sanjeev Gupta will describe you details regarding this overview of this test testing. Dr. Sanjeev Gupta, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, we were discussing about the tra treadmill exercise with ECG monitoring, and we, we have known the indication, but there are certain situations in which we cannot perform this test, and this can be described in which it is absolutely contraindicated like person who has come with acute myocardial infarction, you cannot subject him for the treatment exercise within like say f uh, three to uh, four days. Then you have a person who is continuing ongoing uh, angina that is chest discomfort. You cannot subject him for the stress test. Then you have a uncontrolled arrhythmia like it, it will feel fibrillation or it will flutter, varying high rate. Then severe <coughs> aortic stenosis. In mild aortic stenosis you can perform the test but in severe aortic stenosis test should not be conducted. Then uncontrolled congestive heart failure. You have a pulmonary infarction or pulmonary embolism, and then aortic uh, dissection. These are the certain absolute contraindication of performing this treadmill exercise test. And then there are certain relative contraindication, uh, contraindication in which you have to risk and uh, weigh the risk and benefit of this performing this test. Like once we have uh, known that you, the person may be having a left main coronary artery disease or a moderately stenotic valvular heart disease a person with a severe atrial hypertension, tachyarrhythmia and bradyarrhythmia and the high grade AV block like type 2 morbids or complete AV block or hypertrophic or obstructive cardiomyopathy with outflow tract obstruction. So once we have known that there are certain contract in indication of performing this treadmill with exercise, uh, treadmill exercise with ECG monitoring, then we, there are certain conditions in which probably you can do the test but it will not be of use because you will not be able to interpret the results. So these conditions are like left bundle branch block. In this case, you will not be able to interpret the results of the test because already there is a bundle branch block, so you will not be able to appreciate the STT changes, which is see commonly seen with this test. Then you have a left ventricular hypertrophy with the repolarization changes. Again, this will preclude the analysis of STT changes in this uh, test. Then the person is already on digoxin therapy. The same uh, finding you can get, the <coughs> T wave inversion in that. Then you have a right bundle branch block. It makes you difficult to interpret the test, especially in the lead V1 to V3. Then you have a already baseline ST depression of more than one millimeter. Then probably it's of less use. And then paced ventricular rhythm. The person is on pacemaker. You have a paced ventricular rhythm. Your uh, ECG will show the bundle branch block pattern. Again, in the, those circumstances, you will not be able to appreciate the, uh, or you will not be able to analyze the test. And then the WPW syndrome, that is pre exciting syndrome. So these are the certain conditions in which you can perform the test but will not be able to appreciate or analyze the report of the test. So it is better to avoid this exercise treadmill with ECG monitoring in these uh, group of patients. So once we know that there are indications, there are contraindications, there are certain things which in which you can perform but you will not be able to appreciate the changes. Then we go for what are the changes you can, you are, you are supposed to look for or you can see while performing these tests. See, there are certain things which are need to be monitored, the continuous blood pressure, the pulse rate, and uh, these are the things which you will be monitoring. Apart from this, the most important thing which you are looking for is the ECG changes, which is can be appear, which can appear, or which will be appear during this test. So let's see what are the ECG changes which can be appear or which are the diagnostic of this test to say that this test is positive or negative. So, so these are the uh, things which you can see. So we have to measure the, the most important thing which you can see is the ST depression. Then question comes is how do we see the ST depression or how do we measure it? There are certain specific things or specific points where you have to measure the ST changes. The first thing is ST measurement has to be done at the 80 millisecond at the PQ junction. 
If the heart rate is mo more than 130 beat per minute, then you have to measure the ST depression at 60 milliseconds. The other th important thing is you have to uh, measure the ST slope. ST slope is usually given by the computer which is recording the EC uh, ECG and you need not to calculate that and it is usually uh, the computer driven and it can be displayed on the screen as well as the print record. Then you have to see the if the ECG ST depression. ST depression has to be over one, one millimeter to say a significant uh, changes in the ST depression to say positive stress test or positive treadmill exercise test. The two important things which we need to understand is it does not tell you that which artery is blocked. We have a uh, we cannot tell by this treadmill exercise test that this which artery is blocked. Although you may see the changes like a two three AVF or the most commonly during the stress test you see the changes or ST depression in the V five leads. But this does not tell you that this uh, the right coronary or left circumflex artery is blocked. It just simply tell you that person is having an ischemia. So this this is the thing. And simply if but provided if you if you get the ST elevation. If you get the ST elevation, it is specific for the RT involved. So ST depression does not tell you which RT is blocked, but if the, you find the ST elevation like 2, 3 AVF, you are sure that this, this is in the right coronary artery. So this is the thing that ST measurement has, uh, you can see. Next, there are, I'll show you the some of the ECG which is seen here. This is the normal ECG changes which you can see. So the, for this, for your help, you can see the normal ECG and the landmarks are displayed and this is the P wave, this is the normal PR interval from this and here that is a uh, junction or this is the PQ junction is taken as a isoelectric line that is here to here and from here you can measure the ST depression and the second thing is as I was dis uh, discussing you the, the next important thing is the ST slope which is calculated by the computer and displayed on the screen. So these are the normal ECG and normal slope which you can see. The next thing is to s help you out this is the uh, same view which will help you to understand what is PQ junction, what is the J point and how uh, ST is the placement of where uh, exactly ST depression is uh, seen. See this is the PQ junction. This is taken as a isoelectric line. From where if you draw a line here this is the line where you have to measure the uh, ST depression. And second thing is, this is the J point. So you have to carefully look for the J point while evaluating the ECG. And as I was telling, the ECG measurement has to be done at the 80 millisecond after the uh, after the J point. So this is the three things which you have to understand. First, you have to identify the PQ junction, that is junction of the P wave and the Q wave, to uh, draw a isoelectric line. Then you have to identify the J point, and J point is the junction of uh, ST change where the ST, ST uh, segment starts and then you have to measure the ST segment 80 millisecond after the J point but if the heart rate is more than 130 millisecond more th 130 millimeter 130 uh, beats per minute then you have to take the ST segment depression at the 60 millisecond after the J point. So these are the some of the ECG changes which you can see or in the treadmill exercise the first is a normal exercise response. This is the normal exercise response. Why? Although you can apparently see there is a depression here, but this is depression because the slope is rapid. As I was, told, uh, I was telling you that slope is also equally important. If the slope or the rapidity of rise uh, is more, that if the slope is rapid, that is over 1.1 1 uh, 1 millimeter millivolt per second, then it is taken as a normal. For to say that this slope is significant, that depression is significant, the slope has to be less than 1 millivolt per second. So these are the cha graded changes, some of the ECG changes which you can see. This is a ST depression, ST segment at the rest. Then you see with the mild initial ex exercise, the ST depression is going down or ST is going down. And that further goes down with exercise and during the recovery, it again going back to the normal isoelectric line. So the no this is the ischemic response which you can see in the ECG changes. Then this is the second thing is that here you can see this is the normal ECG. Here apparently again I was telling you that it looks there is a ST depression but this, this is not that ST depression because if you see I, t I was telling you that there is a computer generated ST slope. Here ST slope is 2.1 millivolt per second. So because this ST se although there is a depression which is indicated by the computer although it apparently there looks to be a depression but it is not significant because the slope is very rapid. 
uh, that is 2.1 uh, millivolt per second. So this is a normal response. Here again you can see that there is a, another ECG down below here. You can see there is a minor ST depression less than 0 0.9 milli millimeter that is less than 1 millimeter and but the slope is also less but the depression is mild. We, to say qualify a significant positive de ST depression you need a 1 millimeter displacement. So here although there is a, a depression but this is a minor ST depression. Then you have a, another ECG where the depression is classically you can see. Then you can see here the depression is about minus 2.7 millimeter and the uh, slope is minus 0.8 millivolt uh, per second. So this is a significant thing. Then you have a ECG elevation which is significant and it, it specify the type of artery. The same thing this is a initial stage of elevation this is the Q wave formation and this is the horizontal ST depression where you have a uh, ST depression of say more than one millimeter and the slope is at zero. Then we call it a, a horizontal ST depression. So these are the, some of the ECG changes. If there is a ST uh, elevation which I was telling you in consecutively three lead it is abnormal and it, it abnormal if there is a lead with abnormal Q wave it really indicates the ischemia. You have a, sometimes you can find, you may not be able to appreciate or you may not be able to find the ST, ST changes. Only T wave uh, changes are present. So we have to remember that T wave changes are influenced by the body position, the respiration, and the drug, and the normal normalization. Sometimes you have a baseline T inversion in le uh, especially ladies. But if that becomes upright, it is not a diagnostic finding. So pseudo normalization is not a diagnostic finding. Sometimes it is seen. Then again the change in R wave amplitude as we know with the progressive exercise the R wave amplitude goes down. But the, the, this change in R wave amplitude is non-specific. Again a U wave inversion you can see the U wave sometimes U wave is seen after T wave and it is more common in hypertensions, hypertensive patients and in mid it can it is seen easily in the mid precorded lead and U wave inversion at heart rate of about 120 milli, uh, mid, uh, 120 per minute is specific for the coronary artery disease. So these are the ECG changes which you can appreciate. But So once we have the, the done the exercise with uh, test with the treadmill, exercise treadmill with the ECG monitoring, there are certain parameters which are, if present, should warn you that this, this person could be having a very severe uh, coronary artery disease. So let's see those, what are those parameters. First, the person is unable to complete his exercise that is if exercise is less than 5 METs uh, which will be described later <laughs> and what is METs and uh, Dr. Tushora I will describe. If he is unable to increase his blood pressure over 120 millimeter uh, systolic or there is a sustained decrease in blood pressure or there is a below the rest level during the progressive exercise it is a warning sign. If you see the ST depression over 2 millimeter and down ST sloping ST segment starting at less, less exercise that is less than 5 METs involving more than two leads and it persisting over five minutes into the recovery. It's a very significant thing. And if you get the exercise ST segment elevation or if your person is start complaining of angina at low workload, that is you start the treadmill exercise and then initially very, very soon or within a few minutes he started complaining you the angina. Or if you have a symptomatic or sustained uh, ventricular tachycardia. So the, if, uh, you should be aware of this situation because in this situation you have to immediately stop the test and uh, refer for the person to the further evaluation. You should not continue the test further. So once we have come to know the ECG changes, then the next modality is the exercise echocardiography. Sometimes you may not get the desired information in the exercise treadmill with the ECG monitoring. Then we would like to know what is the status of the uh, status of the this myocardium during the exercise. Then obviously you can combine it with ex uh, echocardiography, which will give you the more information or better information. And because uh, in that, so this exercise echocardiography cardiography is done in with the indication in which the TMT is of probably of less helpful. The indication are the same, which I, I told you the same that once the person has a left ventral branch block, WPW syndrome, or he has a prior bypass surgery, or in uh, you have a, done the angiography where 
you know that angiographic block is about 70 to 80 percent. You do not know what is to what is to be done with this artery. Whether should we uh, do some angioplasty or surgery, or should we left alone? And then in those cases, the exercise echocardiography will be helpful. Or if you know the, where the angioplasty in more than one vessels, and exercise induced dis uh, ischemia will determine which of the vessel is more important to. As I told you, there are, there could be a two vessels which are blocked. In that, in one which one to take care of first in those circumstances exercise echocardiography is helpful. So eco exercise echocardiography uh, exercise uh, can or e e stress echocardiography can be performed by either exercise or by pharmacologic uh, means. So this pharmacological stress testing or pharmacological stress echocardiography performed in uh, person who cannot exercise. So these are the certain indications like orthopedics disease uh, cerebral vascular accident, peripheral vascular disease, if the person is obese then you can certainly cannot perform the uh, st uh, exercise echocardiography then you go for the pharmacological stress echocardiography. Amongst the, as I told you earlier that amongst the pharmacological stress uh, exercise echocardiography the agent which is commonly chosen is the dobutamine which is because it is widely available and it is easily monitored its half life is less than two minutes once you stop this drug the effect will wear off and you can go back to the normal state. So this is the most preferred agent for the cardiac imaging function that is uh, stress echocardiography and it is most effective in producing the regional wall motion abnormality compared to the other agents and it produces the myocardial ischemia by increasing the heart rate, blood pressure and the contractility. So these are the three things by which it improves the, it uh, brings about the ischemia and the regional wall motion abnormalities. Then once you have done the uh, uh, dobutamine stress echocardiography, the result has to be interpreted in the way. Like if the person who has uh, you monitoring, observing the uh, myocardium and it becomes hyperdynamic, this is normal. You have a normal wall motion uh, movements, then suddenly a new wall motion abnormality is present, then it is indicated the ischemia. Or if there is a pre-existing wall motion abnormality and you detect there is a worsening like a, per, a, a portion which is hypokinetic become akinetic or akinetic becoming a dyskinetic then it, it indicates the ischemia. Or if the wall motion abnormality remain unchanged that is it indicates the scar that is a infarct portion. And if a, if a akinetic wall motion abnormality you have a biphasic, classic biphasic response, then it indicates the viable myocardium. So what is biphasic response? In biphasic response, what we happen, this is shown in this diagram. The first diagram shows you there is a scar. There is a blocked artery. You start infusing the dopamine. It remains thinned. Again, at any stage of the dopamine echocardiography, it remains thin. So there is no change in the thickness of the myocardium. It's so, and there is no either there is no uh, thickness changes or no improvement in functional or contractility. So it this indicate this is a scar. But there is sometimes you have a viable myocardium that is a normal myocardium yet it is subtended by that normally perfusing coronary artery. In that case what will happen? In the low dose it will become contractile, it will hypercontractile. If you increase the load it still become more hypercontractile. So this is done uh, response which is seen in the normal myocardium with the open artery. But you have a normal myocardium but the artery is blocked. In that case what will happen during the low dose uh, the perfusion will be able to uh, the artery and the myocardium will be able to meet its requirement. This artery will be able to meet the oxygen requirement of this myocardium hence the contractility will improve. But if the contraction is still continues further then this because this artery is blocked so this myocardium will not be able to, this artery will not be able to supply the desired amount of the oxygen to this portion. So this, what happens, the, the contractility goes down. So this is what the typical biophysic response. So this typical biophysic response is a diagnostic of positive stress echocardiography or positive dopamine stress echocardiography in the test. Then the other modality which is available with us is a myocardial perfusion imaging. In this we are combining this test uh, with the imaging also and this is done with a gamma camera and you, you, we use the radioactive agents to image the heart. The agent which is commonly used is a thallium, technetium 99 and uh, the two uh, 
tracer, the uh, technetium-99 is systemibi or tetrophosmine. The most commonly used is technetium-99 m systemibi. Then these are the images. So let's see what are the images. What this is the first images. The, we image this uh, uh, microbial perfusion imaging in three axes. That is short axis, that is the vertical long axis, and that's horizontal long axis. These are the three standard image which in which the microbial perfusion imaging is uh, is analyzed. So in this you see the short axis. This is the normal microbial perfusion. Here you can see that this amount of the myocardium is slightly less perfused. So this is what we can get the abnormality. And the same thing is shown in the this vertical long axis and horizontal long axis. You can compare the, these two images. Compare these, this one and this one. Here this is a normally perfused myocardium which is imaged by the uh, gamma camera and this is the mildly abnormal. Here you can see there is some perfusion defect and if the defect, defect or uh, perfusion is very much less or this is a definitely abnormal. So you can see this is the normal pattern. You can compare these three images with this. So this is how we can di diagnostic or what we call is a stress thallium uh, test which is uh, we can identify this ischemia or infarction. Then the next thing is that the imaging, this imaging is always combined at the rest and exercise because our main purpose is the stress testing. So we have to give some stress to analyze the myocardium. So these are the images in the rest and you can see these are the images at the stress. There is a, with the stress there is an increase in perfusion which is very subtle which is difficult to appreciate. And this is the short axis view and this is the long axis view. And then next thing is you can see this is the rest imaging and this is the stress imaging. This is the post myocardial infarction. You can see there is a a uh, normal perfusion at, uh, at rest, but as we give stress that this coronary artery to this uh, segment of the myocardium is unable to meet its supply, so there is a perfusion defect which appears here. This is marked as a star. And uh, similarly, this vertical long axis view, here you can see, here this is normal perfused myocardium at rest, but we once we give the stress, we, that means we ask the person to run on the treadmill and with the ECG getting, then you can see the defect is appearing here. So this is the one modality, same thing here is displayed here. You can see that raised imaging and then this is a star which is showing the myocardial uh, ischemia. And question comes is how do we differentiate whether it is an ischemia or infarction? The infarction is a, per, a defect, defect or perfusion defect which is persistent, which is will be able to appreciate both at rest and at stress as shown here. In ischemia, it appears only on exercise, but in infarction, the defect is persistent both at rest and at stress. So here is the image of the same thing. It's, uh, here you can see that defect is persisting at rest and defect is persisting at the stress. So to conclude the same, so the myocardial infarction, there is a perfusion defect is rest and stress. If there is ischemia, the perfusion defect is seen on stress only. So with this, I conclude my uh, overview of the stress testing. So now let us summarize everything. To summarize everything, as I will say that the heart is a dynamic organ. It has to move, it has to move and to meet the demand of the oxygen supply to the body. And to assess any disease of the cardiovascular system, we always assess in anatomical study and then anat to find out the significance of that anatomical, anatomical coronary abnormality, we need to subject the person for the stress testing or when we want to prescribe the specific uh, activity to that person, then also we need uh, this is stress testing or there are certain other situation when we want to assess the severity of the disease to assess the risk or to that person involved in his lifestyle. In those circumstances we go for a stress testing. There are different type of stress testing are available with us or almost every stress testing has a se uh, equal sensitivity with a slight variation in specificity and the the, uh, the modality which is to be chosen upon is always decided by the availability of that tests uh, at the, your centers or place you're working and your expertise into it. Most of the time, most of the time, these are the two deciding factors. And the co next question comes is whether the uh, we subject sh we should we subject the person for the exercise or the pharmacological. It is decided by the associated abnormality, associated problem with the person, like. Uh, any orthopedics or peripheral vascular disease or cerebral, uh, cerebral vascular accident, in those cases we subject for the pharmacological test. 
otherwise we prefer the exercise stress test and once the aim of uh, these tests is always to find out the ischemia or assess the severity of the disease and the assess the prognosis. The, um, amongst all the modality which I have described, the most commonly available is the treadmill uh, exercise with ECG monitoring which you will be engaged most of the time in performing and followed by the dopamine stress echocardiography and then probably followed by the stress thallium. So it is our responsibility or it is we are of interest to you to know more about the exercise stress test so which shall be discussed in detail by uh, Dr. Toshoroy in the coming upcoming session. Yeah, very good. Uh, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Gupta, I am uh, very much thankful to you. But I think uh, uh, in your discussion, uh, our students would like to know the uh, very important thing that if we are doing the stress test, suppose, and what is the emergency condition at it may arise during the uh, stress test? And, <coughs> and, yeah. and uh, what are the pre precautions a doctor should take uh, carry out? And what are the conditions where we uh, terminate this stress test? I think I think I think I'll be dealing with that yeah. because still we have time. Yeah. So we can can start? Ha, uh, actually, uh, no, I'll, I'll my ha, so I'll hand over the this talk to Dr. Shah Roy. We will discuss. Uh, 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 we will discuss about the slides. Uh, all these issues. Slides. Mm. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, Sanjeev has given you a very good overview about all the modalities of uh, stress test that is available. Uh, but uh, we should now go into details of uh, how we actually conduct a uh, uh, tre uh, treadmill stress test because that's the tre uh, kind of test that all of you would most likely be doing. So if I have the first slide, I'd like to go into the something called the ischemic cascade. That means what, ac what, does, what happens when an ischemia occurs. We need to know this because we'll have to identify these changes in the ischemia. We have to identify them to, uh, mm, uh, to get to the conclusion. So the first thing when, when a regional ischemia occurs is that there is regional diastolic dysfunction. Now currently we don't have any modality of identifying regional diastolic dysfunction. We can identify diastolic dysfunction, global diastolic dysfunction, but we are, we are currently uh, and don't have any uh, current clinical tools right now. Or there, although there are, although there are some uh, some uh, uh, modalities like the tissue Doppler by which we are trying to identify, but right now, as of currently, there is no way we can identify that. Then subsequently, what happens is regional systolic dysfunction, as I, as you can see that regional systolic dysfunction can be easily identified by the echocardiography. And finally, after that, we have the ECG changes, which can be picked up by the ECG while we are doing the TMT. And last of all, we get angina. So the sequence of events is the regional ischemia, which can be picked up by the stress thallium, by a new modality like MRI or even by PET. Regional diastolic dysfunction, as yet, we cannot identify. Regional systolic dysfunction we can identify by the echocardiography. ECG changes, of course, by the ECG and angina clinically we can determine. Can I have the next slide, please? So basically a stress test consists of inducing the stress and identifying the stress. So how do we induce the stress? We can induce it by doing exercise. That is, we can do a treadmill test. We can do a bicycle ergometer, which uses the leg, uh, leg muscles. Or we can do a hand ergometer, which uses the hand muscles. Or we can use pharmacological testing, in which we can use dobutamine with or without atropine. We can use adenosine. We can use dipyridamol. Or even we can use pacing, if none of these modalities are available. Now, the point is that we know that stress is induced when the myocardial oxygen demand is increased. And that is increased by increasing the heart rate the blood pressure and the contractility. Now exercise and pharmacological means increases all these three modalities, whereas pacing only increases the heart rate. So in that sense, it's not that good a stressor, whereas the others are an equivalent uh, amount, of, amount of stressors. Um, once we have induced the stress, we must now identify the ischemia. Can I have the slide, please? 
So we can induce it by doing the ECG, by doing the echocardiogram, by the radiopharmaceuticals which has been described, and by newer modalities of MRI and PET. The next slide, please. So these are the various stress which is stress which has already been described. The next slide. So what would be the indication mainly? Grossly, again going over what Sanjeev has said, grossly to rule out a coronary artery disease, to assess the prognosis post CABG or post PCI, or to assess the severity of coronary artery disease, to assess the functional capacity, and assess the exercise induced arrhythmia if any. Now here comes the contraindications. The most important thing is that uh, we, we must uh, know the contraindications because we must not do the uh, stress test when it is uh, dangerous to do or when a person is incapable of doing it like he has a lung disease like a chronic obstructive lung disease or an asthma he has a knee or a leg problem or he's got peripheral vascular disease and he cannot exercise or when it's useless to do it like we cannot identify the ECG changes in WPW syndrome associated with ischemia or with left bundle branch block when it's useless to do the test and the next slide please or when it's dangerous to do the test like when there's acute illness or where there's acute coronary syndrome or myocardial infarction or known severe coronary artery disease or myocarditis severe congestive heart failure severe AS, MS or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy obstructive severe hypertension severe pulmonary artery hypertension or complex arrhythmias or heart blocks or pacemaker because pacemaker they, if the rate does not increase while you're exercising there is no point where we can we can stress the heart so these are basically the contraindications and while I'm stressing on that is that because unless we do the test safely we may land up in the complications which I will describe subsequently and the next slide please so before we do the test we are there are certain requirements so now I'm going to the details of how to actually do the test practically so the details of requirement that are required to be present in the in the stress room is a defibrillator a working defibrillator with a cord long enough so that it can reach the patient's chest is absolutely a mandatory requirement and emergency trace with all the medications emergency medication must be there as well as consumables cannulas and so forth oxygen must be available in the room resuscitation equipment ambu bags endotracheal tubes etc and even the personnel have to be well versed in resuscitation so not only must the doctor be trained but the technician and if the nurse present must also be trained in resuscitation well versed in resuscitation and if you land in a problem uh, the, 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 it is best to do in a situation where an ICCU is available or you have pre-arranged arrangement of an ambulance transfer to a CCU if the CCU is not actually situated in the place where you are doing it. So these things have uh, prerequisites before one actually starts doing a treadmill test. May I have the next slide please? Now when scheduling a patient for an appointment, what should you tell the patient or how should you interact with the patient? The first is that you ask generally the patient, generally get an idea about what is the indication because uh, if that will help you guide the guide the tree, uh, guide the uh, doing of the test and then ask if the patient has any disease like blood pressure for example or diabetes or whether it's controlled or uncontrolled and this has got other connotations for example with medication if the patient has high blood pressure he may be on a beta blocker which generally needs to be stopped for about two days before the test maybe on a calcium channel blocker or a vasodilator maybe on a digoxin that's going to alter the way you uh, interpret the TMT or maybe on an oral hypoglycemic agent in a diabetes. So what are the indications I must, what must, what must I tell the patient in diabetes? Because he's going to come for the test, he's going to come fasting, so he should not take the morning dose of medication. And only after the test is completed, we are going to give the medication and then subsequently give him the breakfast. So it's very important to tell him that he should not take heavy exercise in the preceding 12 hours, that he must be fasting for at least three hours before the test, and then he should not take any tea, coffee, or must not smoke for the preceding three hours of the test. And it is, if possible, to bring along an attendant uh, to be along with him uh, during the test, because just in case you land up in a problem, uh, you, there will be somebody to inform him. Otherwise, you must take his telephone number uh, before you actually start the test. The next slide, please. So once he's actually landed in your, uh, in, in your room to do the test, you must explain the test to him. For you, it must be maybe a routine procedure, but for the patient, it may be the first time that he's ever done it in his life. He's ever seen the machine. He's never been on a treadmill machine. So actually, you've got to explain to him what are you going to do, that he's going to run on a walk on a treadmill. You must explain the possible complications that may arise 
and get a written consent for which a form, actually a written form must be uh, printed form must be available. Then you do a physical examination. The reason for physical examination is that you rule out all the contraindications, the blood, the high blood pressure, the aortic stenosis, the mitral stenosis and so forth. So physical examination is absolutely mandatory before you actually even prepare the patients. By the time you have actually uh, informed the patient that what kind of clothes he should wear, because he's going to do an exercise, so loose fitting clothes, loose pants, the proper kind of shoes have to be told to him beforehand, or if it's a case of lady, you must give, him a uh, give her a gown to change into before you actually uh, start preparing the patient. Then the nurse or the attendant actually prepares the skin by, uh, you know, the, there is, a, there is a, a, a lipid layer of the skin and therefore the electrical contact uh, may not be so good unless well prepared. So what one has to do is use alcohol swabs to, uh, to clean up the local area where you're going to put the leads or sometimes you may use a small scoring pad or a very fine uh, 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 paper uh, where, which you can use or and if necessary you must remove the hair from the local area so that the leads are properly placed and good quality electrodes must also be used because until you get a good electrical signal the whole test will be a, a, a exercise in futility. Next slide please. The lead system that we use is the mason licar lead system in which normally the, uh, the leads, the peripheral leads are placed in the extremities of the limbs but in the mason licar lead system what we do is we actually put them more closer on the chest. So we put the arm leads closer on the chest and also the limb leads uh, down below on the two sides of the abdomen. The disadvantage of this is, this is a requirement but otherwise the patient cannot do the exercise with the, all the leads uh, that are hanging on the hands. The problem with this is that there are two problems. One is that there could be an axis deviation. So one must not interpret any axis deviation changes from this ECG. And the second is that the, uh, the, uh, the R wave voltage may change and therefore one must not identify left ventricular hypertrophy from this. The next uh, slide please. Then there are several protocols that we use but commonly used protocol and that you, all of you will be using will be the Bruce protocol or sometimes we modify it causing the modified Bruce protocol and, and we'll be talking in details about these two protocols. Sometimes we use the bulkyware protocol which is essentially used in patients with heart failure where a very gradual increase in the exercise is done, very gradual. The other protocols are the Norton and the Cornell protocols which are not so much used. So the bulk of them, 99% so of the times or even more we'll be using either the Bruce or the modified Bruce protocol and I'll tell you that in a minute. Next slide please. So that's in detail about the Bruce protocol which all of you must know because most of them you will be using it. This is basically a three minute stage. That means the, the miles per hour and the grade is held for three minutes at a constant rate and then after every three minutes it is upgraded to the next stage. So we start with stage one down in the below. That's 1.7 miles per hour and a grade of 10%. A straight vertical would be, nine, would be a, a 100%. So 10% of that about nine degrees would constitute about 10%. So stage two, so after three minutes we go over to the stage two. This is done automatically by the computer. You don't have to do it manually. This is automatically fed in the computer and automatically it controls the motors to increase the speed as well as the grade, the slope. By grade I mean the slope of the machine. So the patient not only is walking faster but it is, go but he's going uphill. So stage two, stage three, stage four and stage five and so on. Hardly anybody goes into stage six. It's ex uh, quite impossible and extremely difficult for anybody to go into stage six unless he's a, he's a commando in the army or something like that. Sometimes when we feel that the person cannot walk at 1.7 miles per hour, which is about 2.5 kilometers per hour, we introduce two, uh, uh, two stages in between. We call them stage zero and stage half. So stage one remains the same, but stage zero and stage half means that the speed remains at 1.7 miles per hour, but the grade becomes zero percent. That means it's flat grade. You're walking on the flat and five percent, which is in between zero and five percent. So that's the modified Bruce protocol that we use and the Bruce protocol. Next slide, please. Sir, is there any change in uh, uh, Bruce protocol and modified Bruce uh, protocol? Is there? Uh no, there is no change in that. Only thing is that before the stage one of the Bruce protocol, if we think that the patient is an elderly patient or a weak patient, he may not be able to directly do 1.7 miles per hour at, uh, at a 10% grade, which is a significant uh, slope. We introduce two additional stages before 
the stage one, which we call it as stage half and stage sorry stage zero and stage half, where the speed remains the same. The speed remains at 2.5 kilometers per hour. That is 1.7 miles per hour. But we introduce the the, the slope gradually. So first there is no slope. That's a zero percent grade, and then there is a five percent uh, slope. So we introduce these two earlier stages before the stage one, and we call it a modified Bruce protocol. We use it in where we, uh, for example, we, if you are doing it post myocardial infarction, for example, if the patient has an inferior wall infarction, say four days ago, and we want to send him home, so we might try to do a, a more gradual, a more graded kind of uh, exercise, and we may like to do a modified Bruce in those circumstances. Otherwise, for all practical purposes, the Bruce protocol is the industry standard the world over. The next slide, please. Uh, and the one previous slide. Yeah. Sometimes in patients with heart failure, we uh, do the bulk aware protocol. That is, this is a very gradual, it's a just a one minute stage. So every one minute the stage changes. The speed is fixed at 3.3 miles per hour, but it starts with a very low grade of only 1%. Compare that to the Bruce protocol where stage 1 had 10%, where here the, the grade is only 1% and every one minute, the grade increases by 1%, the speed remains the same. So it's as you can understand, this is a very gradual increase in the exercise and not in the stepped manner in which the Bruce protocol int introduces the stress. It's a very gradual way and it's a very good protocol uh, for uh, uh, testing people in whom you suspect is having heart failure. Again, as I said, this is not a very commonly used protocol and the most common used protocol is still the Bruce protocol. Next slide, please. May I have the next slide? Yeah. yeah. Then how do we exactly conduct the test? Of course, firstly, we do the baseline ECG, and we get the baseline standing ECG and the baseline uh, blood pressure. Some people also like to do a ECG on hyperventilation because when the patient is actually exercising, the patient will also be uh, breathing very heavily, and we'd like to see whether there is any change introduced simply because of breathing heavily. So some people may like to compare not the basing standing ECG, to the exercise ECG, but the baseline hyperventilation ECG to the exercising ECG. And then actually we start the treadmill protocol, which is the Bruce protocol, and we continue doing the test, and then uh, we check the blood pressure towards the end of each stage. So about uh, two or two and a half minutes into the stage, as we remember, the Bruce protocol it consists of three minutes. So at the end of two, two and a half minutes, we actually take the blood pressure, because it takes about 15 seconds to do because we actually take 15 seconds to do the test and, uh, and then to actually uh, punch it into the computer. So that's how we actually go on doing the test. Um, and then automatically the, automatically the printout occurs at every stage. And then we ultimately we finish the treadmill protocol and we'll be tell, talking about it uh, subsequently as to where we terminate the, terminate the protocol. And then after that, we ask either the patient to sit down or lie down. Now, the difference between sitting down and lying down is that if you lie down, a lot of blood actually comes back into the, into the ventricle and may actually increase the tendency for ischemia. So uh, some people, most people actually prefer the patient to, uh, to sit down uh, after the test has been completed. And finally, after that, we, would, we should monitor the patient uh, on the ECG and the blood pressure for at least five minutes after the completion of the, of the test. Two minutes more? Yeah. So next slide, please. Yeah. So when do we, how do we terminate the test? So naturally, the most important thing is that when we've achieved the target. So that means we have achieved the target heart rate, and I will be discussing what is the target heart rate. When we have, we have got significant STD changes, and as described by Sanjeev, a significant STD changes would be an elevation of one millimeter in any of the leads, or a depression of three millimeters would constitute an absolute indication of stopping or terminating the test because we've achieved the, what our target. Our target was to identify, does the patient have ischemia? So if the person has a one millimeter elevation or three millimeter depression, we have answered the question quite conclusively that the patient has ischemia, and it might be actually dangerous then to continue on the test, and we must stop. If the patient has angina with a significant STD changes, and by significant STD changes we mean at least one millimeter STD changes. So if the changes, if the changes is progressing, and with STD changes, that constitute a, a, a why when we should terminate the test. Uh, I think, sir, uh, in this session we'll stop uh, till here. The most important from this uh, session uh, message is, like in a 
uh, stress testing, the patient preparation and the other necessary uh, supportive equipments like uh, as sir uh, described the defibrillator, all the emergency medicines and all the staff should be well equipped with the uh, resuscitation training uh, so that they, anytime they can help the uh, doctors. These are the main uh, important things uh, regarding the, uh, this uh, stress test. So, before jumping into the stress test, you should learn and you should practice all these things uh, in a scientific way to uh, give the maximum benefit out of this test. Again, we will meet after 15 minutes. Until then, we will take a break. Thank you.